Welcome. This is the October 19th Beehive call. So far, we have Andrew, Jan, Chris, Michael, G, Patrick, myself, Michael, D. Hopefully, others will trickle in. And we have for our first call, Michael G. Could you introduce yourself? Yeah, I, um, I've i been a Berkeley user since uh, the days of uh, 2.8 on a PDP-11, which was my first home computer. And uh, I've nice. since then graduated to Vax, Altrix, and uh, and I've been uh, pretty much a Berkeley user ever since. Um, I have been a software engineer since about 86. I've worked at uh, Fry Electronics, Sequent Computer, NCUBE, uh, no. IBM, and a handful of others. I do mostly operating system development. Um, yeah. That's it in a nutshell. Excellent. Uh, great history. Daniel, oh, we may have lost you, but go ahead and mute. Uh, what are you working on currently? Because I know the 2.8 release was pretty important, but here and now, what's going on? You have a current project. Oh. You uh, oh me yeah sorry um I currently I work at a company called Grass Valley. We do video production equipment, and uh, and uh, uh, everything we do is done in Ubuntu. And so I've recently brought up Ubuntu in Beehive, and uh, and uh, that's kind of how I stumbled into Beehive. Very cool. And roughly where on, in the world are you? You mentioned French and Italian. Oh, well, I, I grew up overseas, but I live in a little town called Mist in the Oregon Coastal Range. Very well. Hello from Portland. I shall wave. <laughs> I'm waving in the general direction. Excellent. Okay, welcome, John D. Daniel may return. Uh, John D. This is... Uh, other Michael's first call, so I wanted to get that introduction. We've been chatting on the Fediverse, I believe. John, do you have any topics or updates? Okay. Uh, and Patrick, do you have any topics to throw on the agenda? Not, not really. Okay. Um, just a, a short, a short show and tell. I managed to oh. go through with my. Dream lab system. This is a four core Atom with 16 gigabytes of ECC memory at the moment. And I managed to cram in there two SATA DOMs for booting and two one terabyte SSDs for storage. And it boots, of course, TrueNAS, the 13.1 nightly, because all the FreeBSD 13.2 Beehive improvements went into TrueNAS. 13.1, which is a big plus. And as you can see, there are four gigabit Ethernet ports in the back. So I use PCIe pass through of two of them and run an OpenSense VM inside the TrueNAS host. And the Ethernet interfaces are completely separated. So you have a small company, home office, whatever server, including OpenSense firewall in one box. Is there a vendor link you can post to the chat? Should anyone want to go down? Um, for the main board, yes. This is a self-assemble system. They don't sell it as that. This used to be the main board of my main NAS. And when I wanted something a little more beefy, uh, I just bought this small enclosure to run OpenSense on. And then I found it. I can do even more with this because there's some space in there and I can add some storage. Nice. I, will, uh, I will throw the links in the chat. Just Perfect. So. Okay. Two, I just finished the build and the first tests, and all looks very promising and stable and performant and really great, but it's too early for a live demo. So <laughs> that's why I just showed you the case. Sure. Is that hyper threaded so you get uh, a few more than four cores? No, it's an atom. So okay. no hyper threading. <laughs> Use them. I, would, I, I, would, I wouldn't recommend cramming a Xeon D into this small case. Got it. 
Yeah, the 2.5 inch SSD is living directly above the CPU cooler. There's an M2 beneath that. Then there's the memory, but, but it's whisper quiet. You cannot hear anything. I put three Noctua coolers in there and you could run it on your desk. It's nice. really amazing little Excellent. system. Very nice. Excellent. Cool. And so, yeah, I, 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 I did, Jan. I did. <laughs> Give you a live demo next time. Cool. And a, network, and a network diagram or something. Let's see. Love it. And a bomb. Okay. So Michael, that's it. Michael, quick question. Yes. Um, so I was talking to one of the other guys, and are you interested if I were to write up a couple of paragraphs or short paper on, I'm going to call it enterprise perspective? And maybe this is a question for Chris. Uh, um, yeah, so of course. And Chris, maybe you want to give an update because I, John, I don't know if you were able to attend the calls with Chris and team. Or and, oh, a quick question: Did you did you have a chance to review that call with uh, Greg and company? That first uh, introduction. I call? think I re I thought I watched at least part of it. If it's the one I think it is. Okay. How about Chris, you have the floor and John interject as appropriate because I think we're on the same wavelength here. Okay. Cool. Okay, so um, basically um, what happened since the last time, um, I think the last time um, I was here, I was here with Greg, is that right? I'm, I'm that sounds right. I'm actually, that's, okay, the last time I was here with Greg, right? So it was actually the injury call, I think. Um, so what I can tell you is basically we finally uh, managed to, uh, well, actually, I think we already had a wiki page back then. We finally have one for the enterprise working group, and we have the different work streams up there, uh, including the Beehive uh, manageability, and really it's Beehive plus JL, because that is what our original, uh, or the originator of the pain points uh, raised. Uh, and uh, we have a call tomorrow with uh, Michael Ogipoff, who is basically this enterprise stakeholder who uh, was facing issues. I can quickly uh, iterate uh, or, or run you through the points that he mentioned, if that helps. Please. Um, basically, he raised uh, the issue that there is uh, many, many tools in ports. There isn't really that much in base. Uh, the ports are basically not that well maintained. There isn't many developers. When there's issues, it takes a long time to fix them. So this is kind of the, the uh, rough description, the rough outline of what he brought up. And um, we already talked about this uh, this whole thing um, also the last time, um, that there seems to be some underlying um, challenge, let's say, and how we can uh, improve things further, uh, at least when we're looking at base, because we're limited uh, in the set of technologies that we can use, uh, technologies, the, the, the set of frameworks and languages that we can use to develop stuff. Uh, we mentioned this last time already, uh, Shell, Lua, and C, basically, if I remember correctly. And uh, the conversation with Dave today also raised a couple of key points, I think, that are uh, probably good to mention really quickly. Um, one thing that came up is was basically um, when we look at the governance of things, uh, one of the advantages of having a work stream or a project like this uh, that we're setting up at the moment is that we can design and develop something reasonably quickly because the decision processes or, or the decision making processes are reasonably short. Uh, however, we need to keep in mind that this is still embedded within the previous the ecosystem. And we need to keep, keep the key stakeholders um, involved uh, to uh, basically onboard and keep them involved with the, with the design process so we don't end up with the situation that we develop something and then we have the conversation, oh, you should have told us beforehand this doesn't fit the design. We cannot merge that into base. You know? So this is kind of a uh, finding the right balance will be, will be, um, will be a bit of a, a challenge, let's say, also that we need to keep in mind. Um, on the on the positive side, there's something to realize today, and I'm very that's again one of the reasons why I'm very much looking forward to the call tomorrow. There seems to be some, uh, let's say, some shared space. So if we look, if we look at if we look at the Beehive and, and the Shales management uh, 
situation as a, as a Venn diagram. Basically, there is a, an overlap in the middle in terms of the problem uh, statement because both Beehive as well as JL seem to be, um, well, I don't want to say missing, but there seems to be room for uh, or, or chance for, for improving things by um, adding the capability to manage state. Um, yes, there might be different kinds of states for Beehive and, and JL, but at the end of the day, if we build something generically enough, um, then both sides uh, could benefit from that. And whether that benefits it in kernel or user land or how the interface looks like, I think that is a completely different conversation. Um, but I think first, uh, and that, is, that also came out of the day's call, with, first we should understand the, um, the needs that we have um, in terms of, you know, you, let's say user stories where we describe, okay, these are the pain points that we, that we want to start uh, looking at more deeply and go into a design and then go into developing. And um, understanding this, this, this kind of path that we have in front of us was one more um, challenge that we also realized today. And I, I'm probably not telling you anything new, but because it came up today and for me it was, let's say, enlightening, um, I, I want to mention this also as, as my final rule. Um, we will, I mean, the, the, the challenge that the more complex it, it becomes because, you know, it just keeps growing and growing and more pain points come in and it, it just becomes like an almost overwhelming uh, problem statement. And um, so uh, what we realized was also that the challenge will lie in slicing the work in such a way that the project team and that and also includes uh, people that actually start developing on things we will need to keep the work slight in such a manner that we continuously uh, are able to achieve and, 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 and perceive progress because otherwise we might uh, um, we might face uh, situ a situation like probably every one of us has experienced before you know people come in they, um, they face adversity in terms of, you know, not not um, being able to deliver the work that they worked on. They, they build something and then it just actually, I think we talked about this also last time, it kind of goes into this review limbo and then people just go away because they figure, okay, then so um didn't work, you know, and then they just give up. And um, to keep people engaged, uh, one of the one of the major things that we also want to focus uh, on with, with, with this project and this work stream is to make sure that we have this progress. And and here I think we also have the Free PSD Foundation that has the capacity, that has the capabilities to you know uh, wherever necessary support and facilitate the process to ensure that that we have that uh, and we will have that. That's. That's, that's what I have at the moment. So the, pro, the, the PRD is progressing nicely, I think, um, the, the um, product requirements document. Um, it has been elaborated or keeps being elaborated. Um, and again, I want to invite anyone who, who's got time to look through it and give feedback. Um, and um, yeah, tomorrow, tomorrow we'll just call the results will also go into the PRD. Oh, will you please and, make sure uh, that I have an invite one last to the thing, and then I will Go ahead, Chris. Yes, yes John, we'll can, get to that. I can, I can, uh, yeah, um, I can I can share that in a second. Um, word of warning: It is um, 11 a.m. UTC plus two, so uh, might not fit your time zone. Um, then again, my intention is that I will use tomorrow's call also to invite Michael and Johannes, uh, both of them, to uh, to the future Beehive calls, uh, to the weekly ones. Because I think that's going to be easier, you know, if people um, have one room that they actually um, stick to. Uh, nonetheless, when it comes to Beehive and, and this work stream, um, I actually uh, intend to set up basically three calls uh, for the, let's say, three different regions, uh, the Americas, um, EMEA, and uh, Asia Pacific. And... Um, if I if I get some additional stakeholders to join and give some feedback, this will also go into the PRD, and then hopefully we will be able to cycle into a, um, an 
elaboration phase for the um, uh, for, for for the technical aspects of design, but it's also going to be very much about um, um, about, uh, about the um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, Oh, sorry. So look, this is a good time, if you don't mind, let me chime in. Um, um, so, yeah, um, go for it. My meeting just, my other meeting just started. I need to bug out for about 10 minutes. I will be back. Thank you for the overview. I do have some some comments I would like to add, um, but I, I will be back. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so Chris, uh, John is moving mountains at a similar company to the ones you've described. So he's very much the people we want at the table. And so I'm so glad we're finally coming Absolutely. together as a group. But Let's he'll be back. Out. Did you realign your thought there? And could you drop drop the PRD doc into the chat? I yes, we'll find do. It in the earlier minutes, I'm somehow missing it. But I found the YouTube recordings of those meetings. I did give them a watch and I thank you for that. Here's the PRD, and I will also post the um, the meeting details on us. Cool. Oh, 17 new messages. Sorry. Uh, let me scroll some here. Yeah, okay, cool. <laughs> You've been busy. You've been busy. I like that. Just a little um, side chat about uh, trade-offs for home uh, servers. Oh, cool. Okay, yes. Well, keep in mind, we're all fundamentally a bunch of geeks who want to look at cool hardware, so that will... That's, that topic is always fair game. Uh, I'm going to zoom in briefly, PRD. Yeah. Uh, Chris, has this document changed since the last meeting? 1014 additional requirements, okay. Cool. Um, yeah, slightly, let's say. Um, I um, basically added a bit more information in particular in terms of the, uh, the ports, okay. um, how well they are maintained, how many developers they are, how active they are, um, and um, added a couple of those assumptions and constraints um, and risks. And basically, then I also started to compile this, the inputs that I've heard into the functional requirements. If you scroll down a little bit further, I think you, you see a, a couple, of things, uh, couple of points here as well. Yeah, exactly. Great. Great. So, and this is very much, uh, you know, currently written because I don't want to expand this too much um, before I have uh, had a conversation with more stakeholders because this is what I've heard so far without any kind of prioritization or any um, of any um, yeah um, basically this is this is just a collection of, of stuff that came up basically okay and just uh, while it's well you correctly touched on uh, on jail so just take a quick look at this we gave this some attention yesterday, which is the uh, jail wish list where Dave, who it sounds like you just spoke to, went through the minutes and yes, kind of mentioned that actually this list. So that is helpful. And we do have a prioritized wish list now that 14 is more or less uh, taken care of. Let me find that. Um, That's what I wanted to ask, because that was also one, yeah. one of my questions. It's today to today basically how do you guys prioritize that because i didn't see that would, in the script i would argue that the list is not sorted right now the fact that it exists is a great start and it is. Uh, from it, there... it's not sorted by either the pain uh, level uh, for users no pain level to implement no uh, scope of work, maybe some of the things are really small little things. To add quickly, others would be quite projects. Uh, so yeah, yeah. Uh, um, the list is I, grown, what... which is great, but it's not. It, we need maybe a one to five scoring or so, or maybe don't use not number because people will just pick the middle or something. But yeah. Um, Luckily, when I, we when have I was, uh, production. Uh, what is it? Uh, project managers at the table. So, yay! Welcome. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, what 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 I wanted what I wanted to ask basically is, um, and I think Jan uh, raised some of those actually. Um, when it comes to the prioritization, I think on the one hand side, the question is how many or how how important is it for for our enterprise or for for the relevant stakeholders. Um, 
then there's definitely also the question, what is the effort to implement it? Because that would also very much impact whether we find developers for it. Um, and one thing I was wondering is, are there any you know, points that are um, depending on each other? Um, because it feels like um, maybe it makes sense to have some degree of sequence of those activities because others might benefit of, by having some previous points already completed. And, and another thing that I also figured, um, looking at, um, there were some, some items for UCL, I think, and libUCL. And out of curiosity, I checked, okay, libUCL is not in base because I was, I was, I was uh, wrong. initially from, from oh, that's, oh, no, okay, it's wrong, okay. Because I found it in UCL is in base and used by some okay. tools in base, but it, uh, the copy of libUCL in base is a, Base system private API, so it's okay. not part of the. So because of that, you won't find it as a, a stable interface. Uh, the okay. base system has committed to to export to ports or other okay. software. So there's still a port for the QCL, and okay. software and ports should be built against that because the. Okay, makes sense. And uh -huh. uh, uh, libucl's development has slowed down because the basics are all done and it works. There's still things which could be improved, but libucl is extensible through macros an application can bring. So uh, if you have a need for some thing which isn't easily expressible the way you want to in libucl's configuration syntax, you can probably do it by adding a macro. Cool. Let's keep it high level at the very moment, Jan. And I do have some low level yes. topics and reports to and from you. <laughs> but uh, coming back to the high level, we should also uh, differentiate between uh, pain points where people really need a feature to the most important probably to stay with FreeBSD and Beehive and Jails. I can't keep doing this because problem. Okay, this should be fairly high up. Uh, and the other thing is, if I get this, this next thing becomes possible. And then uh, there's the effort required to do it. So even if something isn't a large improvement, if it's easy to do, that shouldn't uh, be a reason to stop do, uh, tackling the little problems just because there are big problems ahead. Low hanging fruit. Uh, improvements, yes. Not necessarily low hanging, but small and well-defined improvements. Stuff like, Improving the output format, adding a new flag to get at some information easily or something. On that point, let's just uh, share this news from like the last 72 hours while I sat at the Open ZFS Developer Summit in San Francisco. Uh, Jan's code was accepted and merged in time for 14, which was relating to uh, tap interfaces and jailed beehives. So you're, to your point of the overlap in that Venn diagram, this one is uh, huge progress. It took some, well, tiny, but huge. Uh, that took a bunch of uh, horse trading and wrangling and reminding and project management. Uh, Jan, anything to share on that specifically? Or is it simply, hey, now we can jail beehive without any networking, if I understand you correctly? Yes. Uh so the regression introduced by an otherwise really useful feature is that Beehive refused to start uh, when locked into a jail, uh, and the jail has neither IPv4 nor IPv6, which otherwise Beehive doesn't need. It's just for one little setup step, which can be done uh, without an IP socket, but the code to bring up a top or VMNet interface so you don't have to set the SysCTL to have them come up automatically for all tab interfaces, uses a, or used to use a socket. And now it's done for an eye optional directly on the tab device, which is, in my opinion, the way it should have been done. But okay, it's just basically 
remove three system calls and uh, change the number of an octals or what that it does. Let's really simplify the code by using a tab driver specific octal instead of the generic way of bringing up the interface. Cool, keep it high level. And I would love to report that uh, a massive cast of characters, including Colin and reverse and uh, reverse and release engineering and others uh, got involved with this issue where the nifty uh, VM images, very important for cloud environments produced by make image, which in turn calls uh, by makefs, which in turn calls make image was not producing valid uh, GPT partition tables. And you should not be seeing a three here. Well, that's been broken for probably a decade or more. And it took a whole lot of communication that you can follow here on getting that on the radar of developers. And ultimately, uh, someone twisted Warner's arm. And fortunately, he jumped in and is, has worked on that. And so we have a commit at the very bottom. Uh, there's no <laughs> reported by, but I'm fine with that. Sponsored by Netflix, reviewed by Ed Mast, and in it went. So I'm very happy about that because that allows some rather cool things to be done with the VM images. And I hope that today's snapshots will include that for 15 at least, which I think they will. And uh, I will report back on some of the magic that should happen. So thank you everyone involved because, hey, it's, it's a very hands-on process to get from a nine-year-old bug to timely fixes, especially when the door is closed on the release. Thank you very much. So that happened. And uh, uh, Chris, that's where, well, foundation is our friend. And when an issue is pitched correctly as impacting all of us, magical things happen. So I'm pleased about that. I will make seeing into being. Uh, John is still away and up. Uh, Patrick, could you introduce? Have you introduced yourself to Chris as an enterprise user? Maybe just briefly describe your environment and number of systems running FreeBSD. If you have a moment. Yep, oh, your I think Patrick, your lips mute. are moving. <laughs> Go ahead and unmute. Okay, okay, okay yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, systems administrator and network engineer for more than thirty years. 30 years on FreeBSD because by accident I stumbled upon FreeBSD 1.0 and rather enjoyed the experience. I used commercial system V systems before that, system five, of course. <laughs> so uh, SCO or HP or whatever was in, in the enterprise environment. I founded my own company together with a couple of friends partners in 1997 we started out as an internet service provider and after a start on solaris we moved all the infrastructure to freebsd and then the company went through several transformations because dsl everywhere by the big telcos eliminated our isp business so we went to website development then to hosting, and now we have a combination of enterprise digitalization, enterprise web portals, plus a small hosting department. The small hosting department runs about 100 physical machines with about 1,000 jails, and our own management system uh, called the ProServer. Uh, I can link a talk I gave at the EuroBSDCon in Paris about the architecture. And we have also been hosting two EuroBSDCons so far. And I'm a frequent speaker at uh, EuroBSDCon events. So I could go on and on and on. I had an interview on BSDNow.tv, but uh, I guess we leave it at that. <laughs> go ahead and drop that EuroBSDCon talk in there because I think Chris yeah, is that useful. Uh, yeah, there are a few speakers at the table here. Um, and Andrew, thinking out loud, I really don't want Lumos to be left out those those issues that we were ripping our hair out about. Fortunately, I don't think you have those on Lumos, so there's that. So there's that. But 
Uh, moving on, John is still away. Uh, Michael, anything new based on what you've heard from Chris, Patrick, and Jan, myself? No worries. Uh, Jan, so let's keep it somewhat high level, but uh, to Chris's points and concerns, uh, in the last two or so weeks, uh, you produced a simple management framework that uses the run it process supervisor and I poked at it late last night. So maybe we'll talk after the call, but uh, hopefully that if anything maps out many of those user uh, issues that are not uh, yet addressed within base tools. And if it is indeed a perfect solution, well, we, oh, thank you for linking that. Uh, then we can look at, well, should we adapt a tool to base? Should we um, import something? You name it. There are quite a few ways to go on that. But uh, actually, before we get to that, uh, do you want to talk some about your state tracking? Do you have any updates on what you were first proposing for? Yes. Uh, jail, perhaps come Beehive or, well, jail, Beehive. Go ahead, Jan, on the state tracking. Well, um, Chris, as you already uh, hinted at, uh, one of the problems you encounter at scale is that the FreeBSD RC uh, system is too static to express the dynamic environments bigger deployments create. And for example, the jail command learns some state in one of its hooks and then it runs to completion and the state is lost. Or the kernel uh, knows that some state change notifies DevD, uh, and now you have to configure DevD to know about all uh, consumers of this event, which ends up creating fragile tooling hostile systems, which aren't well automatable. So, and if you ask, some developers what they want they basically scream for a reliable multicast bus, which you can't give them because that would just deadlock. Uh, I thought a bit about the problem and I think I've found a reasonable compromise. And that's a um, daemon accessed over a Unix socket, which makes it possible to, to uh, register events notify event changes and subscribe to patterns of events. So what's allowed to fail is connecting to the bus because if you're out of sockets, that's just what happens. Uh, registering new state, registering new subscriptions. What must never fail is notifying an already registered uh, event or uh, getting notified about a change to an event with a matching subscription, even if the event matching the subscription was um, created after the subscription. Can I can I jump in with a question here, really? Please, quickly? absolutely. Yes. Um, I think the the concept uh, I, I uh, you mentioned at the last call, if I remember correctly, or you started yes. to to you know to outline uh, the idea. Um, I was thinking about this uh, in terms of, of of jails today after after call the call with Dave, with Dave. Um, yes. in particular with the events that I mean not in particular towards your idea but with the events in general. Um, if we build something like that, how do we separate um, or would that separate also, um, let's say the namespaces uh, of you know we have different users. With different UIDs, we have different jails because I would mm -hmm. suppose we don't want the events from the host in 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 the jails. Or how would that how would that work? So uh, what I'm envisioning is that the namespace is hierarchical, similar to a file system, or what okay. I've uh, modeled it on on a simplified version of the MQTT topics, so which also are hierarchical. And uh, a jail, if you want to, to expose it, and uh, that makes a lot of sense to have a subtree 
uh, accessible to a jail. So you would have uh, a restricted socket which can only use some subtree or implicitly adds its prefix to all events. Ah, smart. So that you basically and, uh, from the jail, it has access to a subtree from the host. Uh, the jail subtree is embedded under a prefix for the jail or the beehive guest uh, or the other user. Um, yeah. So that is the idea that you subscribe to this and then, you, for example, a useful feature which could be implemented on top of this mechanism is for a jail to request for the host to restart it. Right now, jails can't restart themselves. Adgast has written a little hack for just this one use case. Who has written have, that? Uh, Adgast. Uh, yeah, of course. If you have a link, great. If not, that's OK. Let me check. Uh, JD, man. OK. This is, and but it only covers this exact basically, use case and nothing more general. There may be other things you want. But the, the idea is that you can't have arbitrary payloads on the, this interface. Instead, if you need a payload, you map from the state name to the uh, to a file somewhere and then basically update the file because it's just a relative path, basically. You use some prefix, combine it with a relative path, and you get a file which can keep the state right. if you need additional state. A potential future development would be to turn this into a netlink generic family so that it doesn't require a user space server, but instead is also available to the kernel so that the kernel can uh, basically announce state changes over this mechanism as well. And you should always be able to have multiple instances of this for different use cases. And But one would be basically always there if the, in the future kernel module is loaded, the kernel would start using it and def CTL messages would be translated into states and stuff like this. Yeah, this is the idea. At least uh, I have some code, but it's not yet usable. And but the data did... structure is uh, there. I know that it can be done, and the resource allocations are all clear. But it's now it's hacking in the annoying C code to do it because there's a lot of boilerplate involved. And a point I like is that this is your second generation proof of concept. The first one, I think, based on file descriptors, you ruled, yeah. ruled unworkable yeah. and you moved on. And that's what it looks like. Yep. Yeah. The, the first design, like. I tried to get a buy without a daemon, but it can't be done because that requires the subscriber to uh, open new file descriptors to get file change notifications via K event. And that means that an existing subscription could be broken by creating a new state uh, if the subscriber doesn't have the resources available to uh, track the new state. So there must be someone who basically can refuse to accept new states if this subsystem runs out. And the real problem is that we have lots of subsystems like Beehive, Jails, uh, resource limits, uh, Normal Actually, or C.D services, and all of them track some state and are extensible, but there's no way to observe different sources and keep the observers responding to these state changes loosely coupled. Instead, you have to, if there is a mechanism to hook into things, it's always tightly coupled, and basically the one consuming the notification has to know about all subscribers which is why it isn't properly uh, automatable. Okay, that said, could we rephrase that as what other in-base services and daemons could benefit from 
state tracking like this? You started touching on maybe um, firewalls and otherwise. Yeah. For example, uh, you could have something like uh, uh, off PF or um, blacklisting demons or um, in theory, you could have a parallel service startup using this mechanism where a service management daemon basically subscribes to all service changes or at least all service uh, changes it cares about if they're made, um, made available and starts the service as soon as all dependencies are signaled as ready. And you could have, and the important part is what, how this shows that this design is, in my opinion, at least superior to the alternatives, is that you can have multiple service engines working in parallel. You could have one tracking some kind of service and another tracking another kind of service. They are able to observe and react um, on changes that done by the other one without having to know about each other ahead of time. So basically, you cannot have special kind, specialized service starters for things like virtual machines or jails. If we ever get a jail demon, for example, it could basically wait until it's to start a jail until the whatever overlay networking support demon has basically set up the overlay network for the jail to attach to. And storage, yeah. of course. Sure, storage as well. Um, don't start the jail before its uh, template has been instantiated or something. So, Chris, I cannot emphasize enough that it took years to get to this point and We've yeah. on these calls uh, asked these questions yeah. over and over and over, and that's what it took. That's what, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and Jan so, has has and, explored this in countless different ways. We've all written our own jail managers. We've all learned those hard lessons, and let's just not repeat any of those. Go ahead. <laughs> in my opinion, the problem with things like jail managers or behalf managers is that they tackle just one special case of a more generic problem, and it's the generic problem which needs tooling to, it needs a mechanism able to support the more general problem, not a tool to handle a special case. And what we have is lots of little tools handling special cases. And it's, in my opinion, also important that the tooling tries to avoid forcing a policy on users. It shouldn't be too opinionated. We, I really want to avoid getting into discussions like system D knowing what users are supposed to want. We, we should really avoid such um, limitations if at all possible and as far as possible. Some basically conventions or defaults make sense if they um, save a lot of repetition and mental overhead if you for example the run it tool is in my opinion easier to use than its predecessor and its at least spiritual successor uh, in that it has an assumption of where the service directory is supposed to be so if you don't qualify the path it assumes that it's relative to this directory so you can just say SV start service name. You don't have to write out an absolute path or relative path every time, which is really a giant quality of life improvement for the little thing that if you want to use a relative path, you have to start it with dot slash, which is a, a lot more uncommon use case. So it's a good trade off in my opinion. Oh. But you shouldn't go too far with that. Hmm. Okay, uh, Chris, I hope to paint a picture in this of where we are at, how we got here, and I'm glad you've described how we can collaborate. Um, and yeah, follow those tickets for a sense of just what hands-on hand-holding is needed, such as bringing that uh, uh, Mac framework-related jail GSOC project from abandoned to committed. That's just a very hand-on 
hands-on process and we can't get too hung up on the role of say bugs.freebsd.org and reviews.freebsd.org because they are simply tools. They take human handholding to be effective. So just, just saying. Um, other topics or should Jan and I go geek out on um, the run it framework for Beehive? Oh, actually, let's see if John can make it back. I, I, his input is in, invaluable and it's a shame he missed out that first call. Uh, let's see, Patrick and Michael, any inspired thoughts based on the last few minutes of conversation? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet, okay. <laughs> and Unfortunately, opinions. I missed some of that because I had a uh, kitten emergency a seizure. Sorry. Kitten Aww. seizures? Yep. Our new cat takes medicine twice a day for that uh, gift from the neighbors. We can have that conversation separately, um, but yeah. not is appropriate. Okay. Um, thinking out loud. Oh, oh fine. Uh, the Open ZFS Developer Summit Monday, Tuesday was a delight. It was the smallest yet with only 40 people, but it was 40 absolute key critical developers. And so it was uh, a skeleton crew with uh, pizza rather than fancy catering, but that's just fine. Our one screw up was to not accommodate remote contributors during the hackathon very well, such as video chat. We just didn't cross our minds and it was a bit late and that came up on yesterday's ZFS call. Um, FreeBSD 14 oh. is a huge milestone with the inclusion of 2.2 and block cloning, uh, as we touched on in the jail call, could have fascinating implications. So yeah, if anything, fun. experiment with that, see what it can do for you. I'm sure there are use cases we can't even imagine yet. Jan, you... So by, the, by the way, the, I, I, um, or Jan first. <laughs> okay, uh, I grabbed through the code and it looks like it's access to the copy file range system call. Uh, if the CCTL is set to enable it globally. Okay. And so, uh, and copy file range is used by CAT and CP in base. So you could end up accidentally uh, using block level cloning. I think Mav encountered that using CAT. It's like, whoa, surprise. <laughs> Which... Yeah. So, uh, it's not that you have to use F clone file or something. There's no new system call it. And the Z, because normally the VFS would only do that for the uh, copies within a file system and not for uh, files within the same pool, but only within the same file system. Um, the CFS, um, VFS operations uh, has, have a special case where they check if this is supposed to be a clone instead of a copy. Okay. High level, high level. Uh, anything more at the high level? Or Patrick, do you have something? But right now it's beyond. So the important high level part is that so far it's disabled by default. It's enabled through the B clone CCTL. And once enabled, it can be uh, basically hit accidentally, which isn't a problem, but uh, you don't, it's not uh, explicitly opt in, it can just happen by default. Okay. Once the global I've feature been, is enabled. I've just been following the discussion about problems with that on the mailing list and have not tested the feature in any way yet. So that's why. I Are there notable problems? I don't have any out? useful comments. <laughs> The one, the one thing I want to add is that IX systems have already backported uh, 2.2 into FreeBSD 13.2 for their upcoming TrueNAS 13.1 release. Oh, a dot one. Which cool. is really nice. Nice indeed. Doesn't the uh... OpenZFS port still support the 12th branch as well? I'm, I, don't, I don't know, Jan. I just noticed that this is the case, that my uh, 1301 Nightly has, has got uh, 2.2. 2. 
and the upcoming uh, TrueNAS Scale Linux-based Cobia release, which is due for release before the FreeBSD one, already has got uh, 2.2 RC4 or something. And of course, they want feature parity at least on the ZFS level for both their Linux and FreeBSD-based products. Nice. Yep. Uh, there, there will be videos. I am tasked with that this week. And if I fail, Matt will get them posted. But I hope to bang those out in the next 72 hours. Um, other hot topics in 2.2, thinking out loud, uh, RAID Z expansion did not make it, but it is done and done, done. And it only took six years because it was a wee more complicated than expected. But uh, Matt gave a talk on that. Um, um, go ahead, Jan. There is, uh, I think, Blake Free as a very fast but cryptographically strong hash uh, algorithm to be used for checksumming. And the other one is that uh, we have finally um, gotten um, early uh, a board for uncompressible blocks with uh, ZSTD. So. Hmm. If you uh, put your multimedia co uh, collection on a CSTD compressed uh, file system, uh, uh, it will similar to how LZ4 does it, it will try to compress the beginning of the block. And when it, if it can't compress the first quarter or so, it will abandon the attempt. And just write the whole block uncompressed, uh, which will reduce the CPU uh, load when yeah, you write in in addition to that, it will try with LZ4 first because that's way faster. And if LZ4 doesn't give any compression result or value, I don't know what the threshold is, oh. but then it will not even attempt to do the block with Z standard. Okay, that makes sense to use uh, LZ4 as a as the test. And um, yep. Uh, that's I, nice. I put up the list of talks. Uh, so one takeaway from the Los Alamos talk was that with hardware acceleration, they could outperform LZ4 with GZIP, and that fit their data quite well. Um, of course they can. Alan uh, talked about fast deduplication, and it's to a point they may want to rename the feature because, hey, deduplication looks like it will get quite fast and safe. Uh, this was very Linux-specific, but it was good to hear that you know the MATLAB people are using ZFS. Uh, Amazon is using ZFS. Uh, RAID Z expansion, that's the talk I just mentioned. And the shared log pool. Uh, Paul has a very unique use case, but it's one pooled slog, if you will, for a bunch of single VDEV uh, pools, which is interesting. But I'm not sure if it solves something I have to solve, but it was quite cool. So anyway, uh, that was nice. And there is a link somewhere to the uh, the hackathon doc, but let's not go that deep in this. Uh, John appears to be still tied up with his other call. Um, you have an update on the 9P uh, oh, FS, yes. uh, client you. support? For bringing that up. Let's take a look. So Chris, I touched on this in maybe in chat where did I put that? I would love this to be on your radar. Pretty please. I got the server worked out with uh, with uh, Jakub in Poland. And let me make that a little bigger. So this is the other half of the equation. And Juniper has been producing this code on and off for years. And through much reminders, arm twisting all year, I finally got a fresh dump from them after Steve Wills had jumped in and after DFR had jumped in. So hopefully there's not too much of a straying between those code bases, but let's see where we ended up. That's September of this year, September, September. Are we into files? Nope, moving on. Ed Mast is chiming in September, September. And I sincerely hope this hasn't stalled. It's probably not something that will happen for 14, but uh, I, there are quite a few folks. Okay, we left off on October 13th. Uh, Chris, uh, are you familiar with 9P in any way, shape, or form? Or should we give a quick correction? Yeah, it's a file sharing protocol for, for virtual machines, if I remember correctly. Right? Yes, 
Uh, you can check out my talk from BSDCAN on collapsing the stack, getting rid of all those block devices in between, which can cause a fantastic amount of trouble, especially when you have like VMFS and other abominations in the mix. So the idea that you can boot a VM as if it were on NFS or some file system without all the trouble of NFS that has like not quite, you know, not a file system NFS. So uh, I hope that's on the radar of the enterprise working group. And if you have a magic wand and a small budget and are working closely with DFR, great. That would be awesome because that's a parallel effort that I think also could have some just very cool things across the board. I was pleased to see that Wi-Fi box, which is a small Linux VM with Linux Wi-Fi drivers for a say Beehive, la uh, Beehive running enabled laptop is using 9P to some degree. That'll take a little more investigation, but it's one of those killer app features that just has this, this close, this, this close. Anyway, any questions regarding that? <laughs> Jan, thank you for reminding me because I, yeah, I, I put uh, enough hours into making that happen server side. And for what it's worth, there is a standalone 9P server in the code base such that that could be its own service. And I know Ganesha NFS fell out of ports. It has or had a 9P server. It has an yes. SMB server that's compatible with uh, NFS locking. So uh, question, Ganesha NFS. I don't know. I know they had Python 2 to 3 issues, but they're obviously fixed in Linux land. So uh, if you know anyone, was it Gandhi who was using that heavily? I hope they can come to the table and fix that. Port. Question mark, exclamation point. Um, Gandhi, hello, anyone? So that's me putting on my hat for the bell tower to yell from. Anyway. Uh, so uh, John D hasn't made it back. I trust all of you are a bit busy and want to get back to what you're doing. If you want to watch me and Jan try to debug what should be a simple issue on run it. Uh, there's that. Otherwise, I'm happy to call the official call and we just catch up with John another day or hopefully he can make it to the can I, schedule. Go ahead. Can I, can I raise one more question? Because um, I just scrolled, <laughs> your call. I scrolled, I, I scrolled through your, I, I scrolled through the chat and um, I think Jan um, raised a, a, an interesting point that, that that would merit uh, going a little bit deeper because I would Please. like to hear your opinions on that. Um, I, I mentioned previously that uh, Michael Ozipov uh, mentioned that uh, he felt that ports are not that well maintained and he would rather prefer something in base. And, um, and he apparently hopes that in base things are better maintained. And, uh, Jan pointed out that if it is about speed, you know, and, and having uh, more, let's say, freedom of development and ports would probably be the better choice, you know, to keep things moving forward. Because as we've uh, just discussed, uh, when we want to move things into base, then we're looking at a completely different base entirely. And um, uh, to me, you know, it appears like there are things that would probably make sense to put in the base, like this demon that we just previously discussed. On the other hand, there might be stuff that could potentially better fit into ports. Or maybe, I don't know, would it make sense to, you know, try to get uh, existing port uh, developers to adapt their existing tooling to use new things like uh, like uh, if we build this daemon, then bring them to actually use the daemon. Um, on the other hand, there might also be, you know, uh, when I think there is a VRM KMOD that is close uh, to base, but it's not in base. But I think that's a licensing, licensing thing primarily. But um, th there could be something similar, you know, having something in ports that is uh, developed and supported by the base community, let's say, um, but not having to adhere to the strict um, to the strict uh, development and, and review uh, procedures that we have with base. I would love to hear your opinion on what is the best way how to draw the lines and whether you believe where is it the right choice to bring stuff into base and where to rather keep it in ports. When we look at 
Kale's let's 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 actually we're with Beehive. Call. Let's start with Beehive. You know, <laughs> when we look at Beehive management, where is the line? Where would you draw it? Yeah. Well, in, the, in recent years, the uh, general approach has been to uh, relegate more stuff from base to ports exactly for maintenance reasons because the burden to maintain bind or isc dhcp or sent mail for the core team and the base committers is just too high sent mail is still in bind is out um i've been talking to to alan about this and he wouldn't mind at all if, if sent mail would get relegated to ports and uh, many important software packages are uh, taken care of quite competently and frequently and in a timely manner by their port maintainers. I, I couldn't complain about bind from ports or DHCP from ports. So DHCP is, is an interesting example because it's EOL now from, from upstream. So we will have to see if, if this new Kia thingy will fit in or, or not. But but anyway, um, for, for many ports, being part of the ports framework and having a dedicated maintainer or even a group of maintainers works quite well. So I'm not quite sure what my opinion is. Well, then, then I'm not the one who makes this decision. Just, just wanted to mention that that ports work well and that things have been moved out of base because for these particular modules, ports work better. So to, to some degree, it's definitely case by case as you've described. And again, DHCPD is a good example where, uh-oh, ours is uh, end of life and are we suddenly going to be in the business of maintaining an out-of-date daemon? And we've, in a weird way, done that with packet filter where it previously has its own sort of fork. <laughs> Go ahead, Patrick. It's not that that's unusual that's, historically. Well, I, that doesn't, doesn't OpenBSD have, open have a DHCP server we can steal? They just may. They, uh, they, have a they have effectively quite a while ago forked the IRC DHCPD. Correct. You're right. Yes. And, and probably, uh, so rip, and probably right ripped out half thing. the features. Um, exactly. It uh, hasn't gotten a bunch of features. For example, uh, their um, multi server support for clustering DHCPD works completely different from the one uh, from the protocol level. And it's a bit simpler and easier, but doesn't quite so tightly load balance the servers, which isn't normally a problem because you're not supposed to run that close to the end of your DHCP pool capacity. That basically splitting your pool all is a big issue, but it happens. And yeah. But the same is true for everyone else. Uh, so, okay, why uh, open async and not, not the normal async? So, yeah, uh, Christophs, who did Mandoc and other key things, uh, wrote open mm -hmm. rsync for OpenBSD. And in the process, he discovered that rsync doesn't even follow their own product protocol definition. So you get far higher awesome. performance benefits from open rsync, and it simply needed capsicumization, if that's a word, and that would be something that I'd love to see in base because it's high performance. Oh, um, BSD license, it's a good thing. And poor Apple's been holding on to ancient versions in Mac OS, but that's a different. Oh, problem. yes. Uh, the, I think because of licensing, <laughs> yep. uh, GPL 2003. Um, uh, the problem Chris, is that. I'll just say, Chris, your point follow the history with OpenBSD and the relationship because it's a, in many regards a great relationship. So uh, that that's a collaboration where uh, uh, components are more likely to become in-base components than not, shall I say. That's a wild sweeping statement, but we've had some great successes. Go ahead, Jans. One of the problems with recent, uh, basically adopting uh, recent OpenBSD developments is that they make heavy use of their sandboxing uh, mechanism, which is uh, pledge and unveil, which uh, works completely different by design from Capsicum, and you can't really port one design to the other because their design is a bit less formal and less, it's not 
truly a capability base, but it's about restricting the namespaces rather than completely eliminating them. Um, so it's easier to retroactively add pledge and unveil support to an existing code base, whereas uh, it's not really much harder to start a new project with Capsicum, but it's very hard to add it retroactively to an existing code base because basically every time you access these global namespaces, you have to potentially redesign your setup sequence in the code. And uh, that can really be a massive refactoring effort for bigger projects. So something like open async wouldn't be too bad, I hope, um, unless you need to reconnect, but normally it shouldn't be a big problem. I don't know who uh, said it, but I've heard calls to have pledge in FreeBSD, just saying. Yeah. Don't shoot the messenger. It, if you do uh, use Capsicum correctly and completely, it provides an even tighter sandboxing. And that's both a blessing and a curse because it means we only have a few tools which get the full uh, Capsicum treatment. Whereas OpenBSD, uh, both base and some port maintainers, a lot more active and successful at daily maintaining patches uh, or adding it to uh, base tools. All true. Um, yeah. But it is what it is. Um, so, for example, could be that we find out that they have changed their DHCPD in such a way that basically the security model relies on pledge and unveil for a lot of uh, at least newly written demons. And some of their uh, existing demons have really become dependent on this for uh, safe usage. While it would work if you just comment out the pledge and unveil lines, uh, the security model would be completely uh, broken for some software. Fair enough. And Chris, to your point, there are countless workarounds and little hacks and fixes in ports that we might want to inventory and declare, yeah, are bad. We should have those in base. We're so sorry you've had to dance around base to get something done. Mm. Uh, I'm thinking of like Marius's NFS handles hack where it's like, okay, if you want a VM that start, that's based on an NFS root, uh, it's not a, as I recall, true NFS client. It's actually John's territory who mm. will hopefully join us. But uh, I have been having trouble finding that, but I do have an article on the subject. So go ahead, Jan, you had some observations. So uh, regarding the split between base and uh, packages, I think the, the most important usage for bringing new things into a base is if basically they are the um, dependency of other parts of the system. So that if you want, have to be able to rely on this feature to be always available, then um, it has to go to base at some point uh, because otherwise you just end with a port which basically every other port has to pull in. And especially if parts of existing parts of the base system have to know about this feature, then it really has to go into base. Uh, an annoying counterexample is, for example, the root CA list, which is installed as a, a package or port, and it still installs itself into slash etc uh, because it has to, because the base system OpenSSL expects its uh, CA list there. And I found the NFS. And we're the other thing it's is simple that we, um, Go ahead. it really de uh, with ports, it really depends uh, on your luck with the port maintainer and uh, if a committer quickly takes up a resolved problem to commit. Um, it can go awry and then you end up stuck on something. And the other problem which has soured a lot of new users, I think, especially the ones which got on during the move to a more package heavy deployment um, convention is that the official package 
is uh, our package repositories and primaries are built too slowly and are managed in such a way that they don't degrade as gracefully as they could if a port doesn't build. It would be nicer to put the effort in to keep the old version of currently broken packages around so that at least you can downgrade and if you need to fetch it on another machine, you can still install the old version at least. Whereas right now you often find out that if a port ever fails to build a week afterward, it will be unavailable for a week or something. If you don't really know, and that at least anyone outside of the cluster admin and package and release engineering team really doesn't know how far along the build processes are and really you can't plan ahead with it. So because of that, at a certain scale, you really want to run your own uh, Pudia builder with the 2,000 or 2,000 packages you care about. And that's a bit annoying for the, that you have to dedicate a server running the all the latest release you want to even experiment with because you can't build packages for a newer user land than your kernel. So you kind of need a, either a big virtual machine or even better, a dedicated server to run this build machine. Yeah, John is coming back. Excellent. And <laughs> that's one of the problems that if you're talking about it, something deserving of a type of enterprise customers they right now really 